Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to Inside Fashion. Today we'll be talking to Adolfo. Adolfo, a Cuban-born designer of this classically tailored, easy-to-wear suit. It and his dresses and ball gowns make women feel comfortable and even glamorous. It's a real pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. Recently, I heard a well-known designer say that the most important thing to know about fashion design is the selection of fabric. Is that an idea with which you would agree? Actually, I think if, if you have a, a feeling for a design, you can pick up a little piece of anything and just make what you want to do. But what about cut and pattern? I always thought it was important to understand the difference between the bias and the straight. Well, I must say that's extremely important. You know, I, early in my career, I found that that was a, to really do anything, you really have to be very, very, very sure how, how the, the fabric moves and all of that. You know. What's most important to you in choosing a fabric? For example, like silk, I like silk to be really heavy and exciting to touch because then it drapes much better. And uh, I like velvets and all kinds of fabrics. I like satin, brocade, so kinds of things like that. How do you decide on what colors to choose? I could dress the whole wall in black if I could, but, <laughs> but that's not possible, so. So we have to, to think of white sometimes. How do you decide what silhouette or what hemline to show? Well, actually, you know, the type of clothes I design, I feel that they should be uh, long-lasting. I think my clothes are quite expensive, and they should not be just be purchased just for one season. I think you should uh, wear them this year, next year, then you, you get tired of them, put them in the closet, and take them out again. And, and you can wear them for 10 years or longer. How should women decide what style they should wear? Well, that's a rather elastic question because, uh, you know, it's very difficult. You know, sometimes I see clients that I would like them to look one way and they want to look the other way. So sometimes we contemporize. Who generally prevails? Isn't the, the customer mirror. always right? The mirror, I think. <laughs> because, you know, I, I insist that they look at the mirror and then I think they get a, a better idea if it's good or bad. By the way, is there such a thing as a classic hemline? No, not really. Is there any length that you especially prefer? No, I like actually, today I like them just touching the knee barely. And then sometimes I like them a little longer than the knee, but I don't like uh, mid-calf skirts and things like that. Why not? I think they're old and they're in the sort of thing I do, it's not, uh, it doesn't work well. Let's backtrack for a moment. You spent your childhood in Cuba. Yes. Was there a fashion tradition there? Oh yes, very much indeed. I was raised by my aunt, who was a rather marvelous, uh, well, I would say she was eccentric in sort of a very elegant way of living, you know? And she used to tell me that, uh, she says in the 20s, she came from Paris and she has all her hair cut, and people used to follow her in the street with the very short dresses and all of that. When you left, Havana yes. for Paris at the ripe old age of 17, you managed to land a job immediately at a very well-known couture house. For whom did you work and what did you do there? Well, you know, sometimes they say that I work at Balenciaga, which of course I did. But you know, I never saw Balenciaga and I, I never saw the dresses. I used to sweep and pick up the pins <laughs> from the floor. So it was not a very glamorous uh, job. And I worked for another house in Rick and Bong in the back of the Ritz Hotel, and that was really my alma mater. You know. In that house, I learned to do all the things that I experience in doing today. In a sense, when one deals with such a classic theme as you do, yes. one redesigns the same suit over and over again. Yes. What continues to absorb and interest you about that style? There is always a little mystery somewhere. There is a little uh, secret. There is always something that you can change what you did before. It's a new, uh, shall we say, twist. It's a new feeling that you can always make it to work and then it doesn't look any longer like the one before. Someplace I understand that this is going to be the year of the fit. How much of a woman's shape do you think should be left to the imagination? Well, I don't know. I think first she has to have a good fit to be fitted. <laughs> so after that, I would say um, 
<laughs> not too fitted, because too fitted, I think it must be most uncomfortable. And you cannot breathe, you cannot eat, you cannot move, you cannot do anything, and that's not fun at all. You know? <laughs> so, so you're not going to be a part of that? No, I like it fitted, but not so overfitted. In the 1950s, you helped make the hat an accessory that was almost indispensable. How did you first become interested by millinery? By sheer necessity, because one has to eat and one has to pay the rent and has to do all kinds of things. And uh, I was successful making hats, but you know I detest making hats. But I like to see. That's how you first became known. Yes, but I didn't like it. For me, that was almost like a, a punishment. You have to work with wires and this and that and all kinds of things, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> so, it's a, you know, anybody who has ever made a hat knows that it's not the easiest thing in the world. When did you design all those wonderful straw hats? Oh, the Panamas and things mm -hmm. like that. I used to make them when I was at Bert of Grunman, and which in fact it was rather marvelous because I was there, and then when I left, Holston took my job, and uh, Holston and I, every time we see each other, we always commiserate about those very, not very exciting days. Is there anything that you learned from designing hats that applied to your apparel designing career? I think first, patience. Second, maybe patience too. <laughs> and third, <laughs> I think it might be patience also. <laughs> How did you progress from the world of Paris couture to be the designer of some of America's most recognized clothing? You know, when I, when I start to make hats, I must say I'm very thankful for my hats because I met very exciting ladies in my career and they changed from hats to clothes. So I did have a, a complete clientele overnight when I started to make clothes. How did you manage to get the capital to go into business for yourself, especially when you were known primarily as a milliner? Was that something of a problem for you? Well, not really. You know, Bill Blass gave me $10,000. Bill Blass, the designer? Yes. That was a very generous thing for And I to went do. to him at the time and I said, Bill, you know, I, I want to have my own house and all of that. My, my own house, I mean my own little room. And uh, <laughs> he's talking about houses. <laughs> so uh, with $10,000, even in the, in the 60s, you could not go very far. You know? So he did that and then another friend of mine loaned me the money and I was able to pay them back in less than in a year. So it was very exciting. And you've credited several glamorous and well-known women as your first inspiration. Yes. And even your first customers as a clothing designer. Who were some of these women and what did you create for them? Well, first, I did hats for the Duchess of Windsor and I adore her so. She is a marvelous lady. She became a marvelous customer of mine. And also Mrs. William Paley. And then uh, Betsy Bloomingdell, which Tonight I have to dress her up for a ball. And uh, Gloria Vanderbilt, which is the one that I did all the patchwork and fantasy things and things like that. So they were my, uh, my teachers, you know. How would you describe the style of clothing that you were designing at the beginning of your career? You just mentioned fantasy. Was that an important element in those years? Well, yes, because, you know, this was like in the early 60s, like 1962, 63, and at the time it was when everyone was making like a Sant'Angelo and all of that, they are making the Indian looks and things like that. So I could not do that, so I'd have to do my own. And I did a lot of things with Gloria Vanderbilt at the time when she was doing her Elizabethan paintings. Well, your clothes were always very ladylike, and that is a notion that was not very popular in the more free-form, turbulent days of the 1960s. Was your work affected and influenced eventually by that period? Not really. I don't think so. Well, what were you designing when everyone was either in jeans or rich gypsies? Well, I did my own patchworks. <laughs> And, and it works, and it was, it was like, a, a, you know, everybody was dressing very short uh, skirts and all of that, you know. And mini skirts. The mini skirts and, mm -hmm. and micro minis and things like that. I did not particularly like to do that, so I, I did my own fantasy that way, and then little by little I started to make the suits that uh, became so popular. And 
little by little start to change and then I learned to work in knitting machines which I was very much interested in that. Well, that is one of your innovations and as I recall that occurred yes. in the, probably the mid 60s as well, your use of in knit fabrics. 60s. How did that style begin? To me it's very interesting because the suits that I make mostly they are done in knits and what I did like to do was to, to uh, Actually, not to copy, but you know, to see the, the textile fabrics and then make my needs to look like fabric. Are there any artists whose work has inspired your fabric designs or color combinations or a certain style or look? I am not uh, inspired like other designers by museums and things like that. I'm more inspired by my clients. Fashion, the inside story, will return in a moment. We now return to Fashion, the Inside Story. Now let's talk for a moment about almost everybody's day-to-day -day clothing concerns. What is a good basic wardrobe? I'm talking to you about the woman who buys my clothes. I think a suit is very good, and maybe an afternoon dress, a dress you can wear in the afternoon or going into night, or a suit that you can change the blouse and you can wear it late in the evening. And I think with four or five pieces of, of, of uh, garments, you can really travel and go all over the world. If someone had $1,000, which sounds like a How good $1,000. You buy a blouse. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean that? No, not really. <laughs> well, you almost buy two blouses. <laughs> oh, boy, I think it's true. <laughs> but if someone had $1,000 to spend, in general. Yes. How would you suggest they do that? Oh, I would buy a pair of jeans. I think jeans are very good. And a little blazer. And a white shirt. And a, maybe a black knitted dress or black crepe dress. And I think that, that would more or less take care of the thousand dollars. What should we do to ensure a long life for the clothes that you tell us that we should be wearing for 10 years? Well, I think you have to be very careful with the dry cleaner. I would say place them on a, on a, on a, on a drawer, you know, and then like the, if you are going to wear the dress tonight, it would be nice to put it over the bed so when you put it on, it's completely, you know, flat and all of that. And not to clean them so much because I think that's, that's a pity, you know. How often to clean them? I think not too often, really. Well, how do you get them to keep their shape, then? When we make the, the knitting part of the fabric, we hang it for a week, so you get the complete length of the... It's already stretched. It's already stretched, and then we make the dress. And it's done by hand, so it, it works out very well. Well, handwork used to be much more common in Europe than America, and work done on the continent had a reputation for being much finer than any work that was done here. Is that still the case? Well, I think so, yes. In, in Paris, and I mean, in Europe, there is a great deal of handwork. Well, I assume that much of the work on your designs must be at least hand-finished. It's hand-finished and hand-put together, like the buttons of the suit. These are crochet by hand, so you never lose the buttons, you know. And then the armholes and the suit is all put together by hand. You're known, even in casual conversation, in fact, I'm surprised you don't have one today, to sport a thimble on your thumb. Oh, yes, and I feel naked without it. <laughs> Do you still get to sew? I never stop sewing. Really? My samples, I like to make them myself. And I like to cut and sew and do the whole thing. Because then I, I do it the way I like it. Actually, there's something I've always wanted to ask you. Do you have a last name? Yes, my name is Adolfo Sardinia. When did you decide to be known as simply Adolfo? Well, when I started, you know, I think it was easy because to have two names, you know, and, and then I was planning that maybe one day I would be successful, so I, I better start from the very beginning. <laughs> Did you ever expect the media to celebrate your work as it has? No, I didn't really. Well, what are your concerns when you dress someone as highly visible as the wife of a president, such as Mrs. Reagan? It's a, an honor to do that, but I, I do more or less what... Uh, Mrs. Reagan would like to, to be dressed, you know, I would present things and then she said she wanted this or the other things, you know. So I feel secure about that, that I'm not doing something that's not correct. If you could dress another leader of your choice, who would it be and what would you create for them? 
I think I would like to make dresses for the Queen of England because I think she could look very well if I would do things for her. I mean, she looks very well, but I think I could do things. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do for her? All the opposite of the way she dresses. <laughs> Consider the kind of attention, the really avid notice that public figures in their choice of clothing get. For example, the impact of Lady Di's wardrobe and her jewelry. Diane Keaton in her offbeat, casual style of dressing. And of course, Nancy Reagan's Adolfo red suit. Does that attention really affect the way other women dress? Oh, I think it does, because I think the media is so, um so strong, you know, that people cannot help, you know, like when you see it on television, then consciously or unconsciously you are bound to uh, be influenced by it somehow. For example, have you sold more red suits than you did in the past? You know, sometimes I get very um, irritated about uh, when people ask you and they say, oh, you know, uh, I suppose you, your business is going up and all of that because I make things for Mrs. Reagan. But it's not quite like that at all. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't want to enterprise on that. I feel that if I do things for her and she like me to do things for, for the First Lady, for me, it's a, it's a work of, uh, that I enjoy very much to do, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to sell a thousand dresses in account of that, because to tell you the truth, I would not even sell them. I, I feel very strong about that. You would not sell the clothes that she wears, the same style? No, not particularly. I mean, I, I, mean, I would not like to go to stores and say, oh, I did a dress for, for the first lady I want you to buy. I think that, uh, that, is, that is not my style. How do you design for a client who does have an innovative style of her own? Well, it's a communication. Sometimes you have people, they come and they insist to have what somebody else has. And uh, that's not very simple because what is good on you it might not be good in another person. And sometimes it doesn't work. Which American woman or women would you say have had the most impact on the course of American fashion during the last two decades? Well, that's a tough answer. Well, I think Mrs. Onassis has a lot to, to, to do about that. I've often heard you describe these times as one of a revolving society. What do you mean when you say that? When I've been to stores, I've met clients who would like to come and buy something from me, and then they could not afford it. And then do you realize that five or seven years after, the same person would come and would be a marvelous client, and she would tell me herself, she said, well, you know, when I met you first, uh, I, did, I was not affluent to be able to do, but life has changed and I am able to buy all of these things. And I think society revolves like that. I think America especially is like that. I think people here, they, they are champions, you know, they work hard and things like that. So if 99% you succeed if you, you try, you know. Some fashion designers nowadays extend their ideas to what I think is described as total design. They create things such as sheets, cars, almost anything, as well as clothing and accessories. Mm -hmm. Are you also involved in licensing products? So I don't like to get involved in things that uh, doesn't mean anything at all and say Adolfo. I think it's more interesting that I would be pleased with what it carries my name than to have a thousand things that has nothing to do with me. You know. What's the essential difference between fashion and a fad? A fad sometimes it can be so so quick, you know, so so instant that you don't have time to uh, to love it, you know, to, to live with it. And and there are other things in fashion that if they are not so radical, then you you become to love them and, and live with them for a long time. Do you ever design fad clothing? I don't think so, unless they have become fad. But I I hope not because I don't like that. And you really want yours to be more classic. I like them to be long lasting and inter interesting to, to you for, for you to keep them. In your own case, a navy blue jersey or a navy blue sweater seems to be your uniform. Do you ever wear your own clothes? Well, I tell you, if I come here today, the way I dress, I, everybody here will think, who am I? But <laughs> I even forgot my shoes, you see. I, I yes. am not interested in myself. I think that if I put a, a sweater or something, I, I, I don't care the way I look. I, 
It's but not, if you feel that way, why should we feel any differently? Because I'm interested the way you should look, not the way I should look. Like, you look so pretty like that. I enjoy to see that. And okay. I enjoy to see women look beautiful, and I, I like to see men looking very well. I think it's my uh, temperament. It doesn't... Uh, you know, I wake up in the morning, and I go and I have a shower, and I, and I like to wear white... Uh, dog pants every day because I, I like to, to wear them. And I put this sweater which is about to collapse in a minute <laughs> at, the, at the elbows, but I like it. It's not it's eccentricity, it's truly, I, I feel good like that. What caused you then to start designing clothes for men? I do design clothes for men and I have never worn them. But I am. Uh, <laughs> Why? Because they don't look good on me. I, I look strange when, if I would put them on. But I like to make them and I'm so excited to get beautiful fabrics and fours and fours with fittings and all of that. But I would never put them on me. Are there any colors or combinations of colors with which you particularly disapprove? Uh, let me see. There is a color I don't like. I don't like something they call periwinkle. <laughs> and I hope nobody has that here because I don't want to film anybody. But I don't like that. But I like red, I like black. I like red with lots of orange in it. Really red, red. What do you see as the most neglected area of fashion design? I think, now that I've asked you the question, I think shoes are the most neglected area of fashion design. And they should be so beautiful, you know, because... Uh, and they should be so comfortable, too. Yes, but that, you know, that is something that is not, sometimes it doesn't go hand in hand, comfortable and, and fashionable, but uh, we try to make them. But that is an important element in your design, isn't well, it? Well, it is indeed, yes. But shoes is a, is a difficult department, I think. If you were to have a retrospective of your work currently, what would you emphasize? Well, I must tell you, I have a terrible aversion to retrospective. I, I don't like to do, I don't like to go back on things. I think the past sometimes was very difficult and I don't want to, to think about it. So I don't, I, I don't think I, uh, I, 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 would not, I would not be a good subject at that. Why? It's like if somebody would come and tell me, do you want to uh, um, die and come back again? I certainly don't want to return. <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> well, I don't mind to go, but I don't want to return. You've said that you don't consider yourself an interesting designer. Besides your obvious humility, what do you really mean when you say that? And who would you consider an interesting designer? I don't think I'm interested at all. I think I, my job, I enjoy to do what I do, and I, I like to oblige, you know, and I... Uh, and I enjoy enormously to do all the things I do, but I, I think Bill Blass, for example, is a very interesting person. I think Holston is an interesting person. You're saying interesting person or interesting designer? Both. I think Mary McFadden is absolutely extraordinary. She, she's, she's, uh, you know, that once I saw a dress of her, I like it so much, I went and I bought it and I took it, I took it to my house to look at it, because I think they are so beautiful. What do you see as the future direction or emphasis of your work? Well, I have a, a, I'm very philosophical about that. I, I think it's a, I would like to do the things I do until uh, people want them. When they don't want them anymore, then I will go away. Where would you go? Oh, I take my dogs and I pack and go someplace else. <laughs> In addition to obviously being one of the nicest and most reliable of men, Adolfo is also a designer who can be counted on for clothes whose cut, line, and fit are classically American and permanently in fashion. Thank you, Adolfo, for your candor and generosity.